Sorry about that, everybody. Welcome to the final workshop. Um, fun, fun video call things, of course, happening. Um, I hope you guys have all been uh, enjoying these uh, couple rounds of workshops this week and a uh, couple weeks ago. And um, for everyone tuning in later, welcome. And um, I'm happy to see you all. So, you know, let's get down to it. Um, we're going to start right where we left off last time with our um, beginning of the of our basketball micro game and we're going to look into some troubleshooting and then revising to take our testable prototype and make it first a little bit more testable and then get it to be get a little bit more fun and we and then we can um, kind of layer on more features as we go one by one once we get to that good prototype stage so um, welcome officially, everybody. I'm Naomi Eberly. I apologize, I still haven't changed my Zoom name. So um, uh, today is August 19th, 2022, um, and this uh, workshop is sponsored by SNAP. We're using Lens Studio version 4.5, uh, 4.25, pardon me. So, uh, so let's jump into that. And um, so, there we go. So if you'll recall last time, we were running into this issue where we had multiple transform inputs on the ball. So we had um, we had the camera uh, affecting the ball via, via its relative space um, because the ball and all, and all of the system that's creating it, we wanted to be kind of parented to the camera so that we could shoot the ball from user perspective. But we also had the physics uh, system in a separate relative space um, which was specifically in our plane space, uh, or our plane tracked space, I should say. And so, so we're seeing this, this competition between those transform inputs to the ball is just causing it to kind of reset the physics system each time and just, and just do this slow fall where basically every frame it's thinking like, oh, I'm starting to fall from zero speed. And, and we want it to be able to have some acceleration so that it can you know, go faster and, and bounce off the ground and stuff and just behave like a ball. So, um, so what we're gonna do, uh, you, um, I already had a script up for a second there, as um, we're gonna add a little script, which is kind of like a really focused version of the behavior script. So let me hide a couple of these things and real quick before we start, I'm gonna create, um, a scene object right inside our world com uh, object controller, which is what's controlling our plane tracking. And I'm gonna call this our court group. Um, so this is where we can we can put all of our elements that are gonna make up the court and um, and the ball. Uh, and so first of all, let's, let's pull this cannon back into the court group. And I'm gonna rename that real quick to our shot spot. Um, because you know we we have a we have a visual canon so far and um, so but but we're we're really just we're going to want to be shooting the ball from the user's perspective. So it disappeared because um, we've we've seen this last time where um, it was parented to our camera. So when when it's here relative to our camera. Uh, in in uh, the space, it follows our camera around. So whenever the camera moves, it's going to pull it along with it. Um, now that it's in our court group back in the world uh, plane space, it's just going to stay under there. And so just, just for uh, a little bit of clarity, I'm going to move that back inside. And so, so now we're back to where we were before we initially set it to follow the camera, where we've got the ball like you know, falling nicely and it sort of rolls, but, um, and could stand to bounce a little bit, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so, so let's get to that. That's a specific behavior script. Um, we're not gonna actually create the script today um, just so we can get to other things, but uh, I, do, I do wanna take a look at it. So remember that every behavior script is it's drawing, it's drawing a script resource, which is instructions for um, creating some form of trigger and response relationship. So uh, each copy, each component that uses that behavior script is going to look for 
one of these types of triggers and there's a wide array of triggers and a wide array of, of response types. And we have this like set position and set rotation, but um, unfortunately for our purposes, this, this use case is like, a, is a little bit um, beyond what the, what the behavior script is designed to do. It can do a lot, but it has, it has this, a set of specific position uh, value where we want to move the object. And in our case, um, we actually have, have a floating point. Like we, there's not one specific position that we're going to want to set to every time. Um, we are going to want to, like, like we have a, um, a, a point that's going to be following along with the camera. Um, and we basically want to, in, in that exact frame when the ball is created, we want to snap it to that point really quickly but then it's going to stay there and, and it's still going to live within the relative space of the physics system. And so the way we can do that is we can, we can have them both, uh, the, the script will have both kind of the camera and the object reference the same space uh, in terms of world space. So just to make sure that they're communicating between each other properly, they're, we, we're going to give them some functions that allow them to each kind of focus on a point and say, okay, we, we want, you know, we want, we know we want to join at this point. What does that in relation to just the largest, um, you know, the outermost relative space where all of, you know, all of the scene objects live that isn't inside some, something's relative space, like not a child of the camera or a child of the, uh, of the object controller. So real quick, I'm going to set this back to or instantiate prefab just to make sure that that doesn't break. And then um, I'm gonna, I've got a copy of our script that is kind of our specific behavior. So, um, so let's dive into that. Um, I'm gonna open up the script editor and you can, we can, we can double click on the resource and that will bring it up. Um, and, and, we're, and we're gonna take a look at, uh, just a quick look at what's going on here. Um, so there's, there's three things that I want to look at. First of all is this input line. So this is a special kind of flag. Like usually if you see these two slashes, it's a comment that's going to be ignored, but this, uh, at input flag is kind of a higher, a higher level part of this, uh, of this script, uh, resource blueprint that's saying, okay, we want whoever's using this component and building this lens to be able to specify a specific object that's in the scene. So we want them to be able to input a scene object. And for the purposes of this script, that's going to be called target. So that's a that's already giving us a problem as soon as we've uh, implemented this, because um, we're, we're, we're running an error here. And the reason is because we haven't specified that target object yet. We're asking to get its transform component, but if we take a look back at the script component, it's asking for the transform component of nothing. And so, and since since this is like a smaller script, it's not the the behavior script that's kind of already designed to account for sometimes if things are missing, um, it's running an error. So we'll want we, we'll need to specify a target object. And what we're gonna what we're gonna do. Um, once we once we specify that is here's here's our trigger. Th these two lines define um, what kind of trigger this uh, script component is going to be looking for. So it's a tap event, and then everything inside these uh, oops I don't want to move that everything everything inside of these uh, curly brackets is going to be the response to the tap trigger. So we want to take that target object and we want to copy. It's world rotation, so that's its rotation value, as seen by you know that that big you know the the outermost scene object, and we want to set that value to the the self transform. So whatever whatever object is carrying this script component, that object's transform we want to set to the same rotation and position values as the target object. So let's set up a target object. What we can do is um, we can give we can give our camera a child object. So I'm going to right click on the camera and create scene object, and 
I'm gonna call that our target shot spot. So now we have an object sitting sitting right on like right on the lens of the camera. So I'm gonna move it to the position kind of where we where we had our cannon initially. Um, and now I just want, I want to go to that script component and I'm gonna drag our target shot spot object in there. And now the lens can reset and, and it awakens. And now, okay, it runs through this script and it has a target object. So it's able to compute that. It's not there yet, but as soon as we tap, it snaps to that position and it's facing sideways. So what's that all about? Um, often things, things will be arranged along, ac along a certain axis, but like this cannon might be it's sort of its barrel might be facing out the X axis, whereas our target shot spot, the, the direction kind of like looking down the camera that we want to use is Z. And so since, so usually when, when something like this happens, it probably is exactly 90 degrees off from what we want to look for. So, um, so what we can, what we can usually do is just, type in a 90 into the axis that we want. And so the cannon's kind of facing this way. We want it to face forward. So that's gonna be a rotation around that vertical axis, which is which is Y. So I'm gonna give the target 90 degrees rotation on the Y. And now every time we tap, it's going to, it's going to use that new rotation and it's facing towards us. So let's give it negative 90. There we go. Okay, now it's facing out and it's a little hard to tell, but uh, the ball is popping out. And if we hide our Canon um, visual, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete a couple of these excess, excess objects that we won't need. The old vis vision, the visual components of the Canon. And if you'll recall it, the, the template had some walls set up to like give it more of like a physical barrel. We won't need a barrel really, so we can get rid of those and then for the actual, the actual visibility of the Canon barrel itself, I'm just gonna deactivate its render mesh visual. And so now it still has this tween object or, or this tween script component acting on the Canon object. And, and we looked at that last time, it's just giving it a, a sort of sweeping back and forth rotation around its Z axis, which in, in this case is sideways for the, uh, is kind of the sideways axis for the cannon. So it's going up and down. We can rename this to be our rotator. And so now when we tap, the ball is flying as we want it to. Um, and it's, it still lives inside that, uh, it's, it's always being created inside that court space. If we take a look at the scripts that are, that are making that happen, the ball, each copy of the ball prefab is instantiated under the parent space of Canon ball parent, which is right here. It's in, it's in our court space. Um, but, uh, oops, uh, well, one, one more thing on that. Um, but at the same time, the, uh, we have, we have the, the new script that we just applied, which is right at that moment of tap is popping this, this whole system, including the cannonball parent to the world position of wherever that target spot in front of our camera is. And so, um, so then when the ball creates itself, it is, it lives inside of the physical simulation space, but it's also using, it's kind of looking at the relative rotation space of that rotator object, where, wherever it is in its, in its sweeping motion, and it's using that vector. And that's always, that's always gonna be the X uh, axis relative to the rotation. So we want it to just blast out that way. And so, so it's able to use, it's, it's able to live in the space of this uh, cannonball parent, but also apply a one-time force to itself relative to another object. And if I actually reactivate our cannon real quick, the cannon itself, is, it's kind of weird that it's like floating around in space there. Um, it would be nice to have a visualizer so that we could see what that angle was. Um, but for now, let's, 
let's look at that in a moment. We'll we'll hide the we'll hide the canon for a little bit. Um, file that away under things that would make the lens a little bit. Um, you know, it, it would be like little improvements to it, but aren't necessarily our main function. We remember back to our algorithm. We want to be able to shoot the ball and we want it to be able to go through the hoop and score a point. And we want the lens to be able to know that. Um, so, so let's set up our hoop. The hoop is huge right now. It's like, it's way too easy. I mean, like all these balls can score at once. We're constantly scoring points, which, you know, Awesome. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's good. You know, make it, make it a little easier on us. No, we want this to be challenging. So I'm going to go into our examples and pull a couple more things back out. So that started out as our rail. I'm going to rename it as the hoop. Uh, we'll, we'll call it the hoop colliders because remember this, this rail is composed of a bunch of little box colliders that kind of form that ring shape. So we want those as part of our game. So let's drag those into our court. And a couple more things. I wanna keep the ground because you know we're gonna need a, a ground to bounce off of. And I like having the walls. It's, they're, they're a, little, a little tricky to see, but well, they're easy to see on, on this scene panel as soon as I scroll back through them. But I think they, you know, they provide a nice environment to kind of keep everything contained and not just flying off the side. So they're there, we'll use them. And that should be everything that we need from inside the um, examples. So now I can hide that. And now we've got everything that we need in our court group, all, all kind of in its own space without, with a little bit less distracting stuff. Clean as you go. Um, and so, so let's, let's fix our group. Um, it is huge, so we'll scale it down. And we can move it a little bit closer. Um, and the reasoning for that is we've got this preview video and, and a lot of the preview videos for plane tracking work in a similar way where there's just a little bit of camera shift. Um, so just, just to make that a little bit easier for ourselves to test, um, <laughs> sometimes the ball can get stuck on those little, little hoops, which is kind of funny, but, um, Pretty much whenever whenever we are shooting the ball using the current settings, it's it's landing right around this area. And so, you know, later on we might want to, we'll probably want to have the hoop towards the back so it's a little bit more challenging. But uh but that would require us to every time we test the lens, we would have to push it to um the mobile device, which is good and it's important. Like we definitely are gonna eventually want to test this lens. Um, in, in sort of the real user environment that people are gonna be seeing, but just for, for the purposes of right now, to make it easier on us to set everything up, we're gonna keep it a little bit, a little bit closer just so it works with this, uh, with this preview video. And it seems like we're a little closer. So, that'll, so that will, based on the current settings, it'll allow us to kind of sometimes score and sometimes not score. And we'll be easy, we'll be way easier to, um, to kind of test, oh, I'm doing funky scales right now, to test um, the behavior of, of scoring versus not scoring because we're, we're in a position where this um, preview video allows us to score easily. So let's, let's add a couple of things to this hoop. Um, First, I'm going to do I'm going to do a quick trick because um, the current the current object here has some funky positioning and scales and um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do kind of a parent space swap. We're going to create a child scene object of this hoop colliders, but we're going to use that as the group for the rest of our uh, objects. Um, and the reason we want to do that is because if we create our collider. So, so we, wanna, we wanna make a collider that is going to detect whether the ball overlaps kind of the space in the center of the hoop. And so if we create that object and we'll name this our score detector and we add a, um, a physics collider component, that list is always like 
oh, distracting me. I'm like, oh, I want to add all the components all at once. Um, so it's a sphere, but and it it seems to have no you know abnormal transforms. But since since that parent hoop colliders group had some funky scales, this this object within is already showing up with a little bit of those funky scales applied to it. So so we can pull that out of the group. Um, if you if we drag it down, you'll see there's like kind of a, a little bit shorter line and then a longer line. Um, so if you go if we go for the longer line in between these two, it will it will pull it out one level, and that way we can also not have to scroll through all the hoop colliders every time. And now that now that it's out in into our main court grouped space, um, there's no no extra funky scales being applied to it. It kept the funky scales from before, but now we can just set those to one 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 zero zero zero. And, and but we don't want to reset its positions because it's nice. It's nice that we already have it here, um, and we can we can we can now use this this main scaled object as the uh, as the parent for our. Um, for our hoop, so uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna duplicate this one, and this will be our hoop group, and that'll that will kind of hold all of the different parts that are making our hoop happen. Um, and now we can we can drag these objects that are positioned in the same place to the hoop group, and now relative to the group, the score detector has has zero positions because it's right on, on the same on the same spot. Um, so the group won't need a collider. That's just kind of an organizational thing. Um, but we can we can move our our actual physical hoop up so it aligns a little bit better. Um, and you know it it still has just just for those just for those visual components, it still has a little bit of uh, transform, but our detector is in the center here, and now we can add additional things into this object, such as uh, let's let's create one more collider in here, and that's going to be we'll we'll create an, another object uh, as a child of our hoop group, and this is going to be the backboard. So so while we're while we're here, we'll we'll add a backboard. Just because it is, it is kind of easy to shoot shoot past uh, the hoop, and that'll make it a little easier to test the scoring. Um, if so, so we create our we have our backboard object. I'm going to move it back a little bit and move it up a little bit, and um, so I can mess with this object scales because it doesn't have any child objects, and so. It's just representing its own size. I'll make it a little thinner, not too thin, because um, one thing to be aware of with the physics calculations is if if the ball is going really fast, um, and and this and it's a pretty rare occurrence, but if we have it too thin and the ball kind of calculates its position at one frame here, and then at the very next frame, like based on where, based on its current speed, its next position would be like out here. It has a possibility of just phasing through that really thin object. Um, and so, so if we give it a little bit of thickness, then um, that will, that, that'll just, it's, it's a good way to decrease the chances that the ball will phase through because it's more likely like, it's, it's, ve it's very unlikely that it's gonna, you know, teleport from here all the way to here without at least hitting the backboard a little bit. And we can give it like a more proper, width and height. I'm thinking based on the size of our reference ball, the, the hoop itself is actually quite, quite large. I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. So it's like about, I'll test with our uh, ball prime, our reference model. It's like about a, a little bit less than twice the size of the ball. And um, that's important because that way we can we can have a score detector in the very center spot, and oops, I want to scale it on all the axes. And basically, any 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 point that this ball goes through the hoop, it's going to be able to hit that detector. 
um, by, you know, it's, it's like, like no matter, even if it's right at the edge, it's gonna be able to overlap that. And we'll, we'll leave the detector a little bit big. I'm gonna hide our, our reference ball prime for a second, just so it's a little clearer. Um, and now let's, let's set up our detector to actually detect and show scoring. Um, so first of all, if we show this in our scene and I'll, I'll set our backboard as show collider as well so that we can see both of them in the preview. Um, if we shoot our ball, it can kind of get stuck there. I'm amazed that happened on the first try uh, because our hoop collider or our, um, our score detector, pardon me, is still tangible. So we can still have collisions and still actually crash into things. So we'll want to set that to intangible so that things can fall through. And now we want to check if, uh, if the ball is overlapping with that. So let's add a, a component. And that's going to be a script component. This will be, we'll be able to handle with our behavior. So I'll add script and search for behavior. Awesome. Okay, so we want it to detect scoring, which means we want it to detect if the ball overlaps the spot going, going through that hoop. Um, so for our trigger type, we can go all the way down to a physics collider event. And um, just, just to be safe, uh, you know, I think, I think it's, it's reasonable to guess that this, um, that this collider component will be able to assume like if there's nothing we're going, we want to put it on the, we want to use the collider from the same object, but just to be safe in this case, we'll, we'll be absolutely explicitly clear with that. So we want it to detect based on our score detectors physics collider component. Remember, it can't actually collide because it's intangible. So even though it's still called a collider, we want to look for overlap. And on enter means that um, as soon as something starts overlapping. So basically as like on the very first time that a ball is occupying the same space as this collider, that's the trigger. Um, we won't filter it out um, that we can, we can specify certain types of objects, but the only objects that we can really expect to be moving through there are the balls and we're gonna to wanna to be able to check scoring on all of them. So let's, so we'll set the response type. Um, what should we do? We don't have we don't have any way of tracking scores yet, and I'm going to argue that for the purposes of getting our first test, it doesn't matter. And it, and that's that's definitely going to be kind of a next improvement component. First, I want to check if our script is working, and and just the way I like to do that is um, just by enabling and disabling an object. So for the response, we can set this we can choose this set enabled and uh, open those up again. And so we need to have some kind of visual just to show that a scoring event was detected. So I'm gonna create one more child object of our hoop group. And this is gonna be our score text. And so we'll give it a text 3D component because it's living in the 3D scene. And it's very hard to see. It came in with, uh, with a font that's pretty small for our purposes. So I'm just gonna bump the font size way up. And so now you can see this 3D text component um, created right where our group was. I'm gonna move it back up uh, kind of into the backboard. And if it, pokes, if it pokes out a little bit, that's no problem because our text doesn't have a collider component. So it's not going to affect the way the ball hits that rectangle. The ball will be able to kind of go through. Um, it might be a weird visual, so it'll, it's good practice to move it back a little bit so that um, to avoid those visuals, but either way, it won't affect the, the actual physics of the ball. And let's give this some more fun, a more fun text value. We'll go score, awesome and kind of move it up so that it works with our preview video, which has this convenient open space on top of the backboard. I don't know, it all, it all lines up and, and it looks nice. So, so now we can go back to our score detector and go to its uh, script component 
And we can set a target object that we want to enable once that overlap event is detected. And so now the score is still always there. Um, we want to make sure that the text starts out disabled um, so that we have something to enable in the first place. And now the ball can, it's still, it's still getting stuck on there. Oh my goodness, am I gonna even, there we go, <laughs> got one. See, it's still, it's still a little bit of challenge with this preview video, but now we've got the score detection working. It doesn't hide the text, but what we can do is uh, we want, we know we're gonna want the text to pop up for a second and then hide after a second. And so I'm gonna copy and paste this, another copy of this same behavior because we already have this set up to trigger based on the um, overlap event. But I'm gonna paste it and we'll just change a couple of things because, so, so we've got the first script component. On the overlap, show the text immediately. The second one, um, on that same overlap event, start a timer. We're gonna boost the delay time a little bit to, we'll say one second. And, and at the end of that timer, then is, is when the second response is gonna uh, kick in. So we want it to disable. And now I keep, I keep hitting those rim shots, oh my goodness. So now it enables and we see that we scored, but then the text goes away. So, so we've, we've got all that hooked up and, um, and, and we know that you know, it's, it's set up in a way that we'll, we'll be able to detect uh, scoring and later on set up some set up a point system if we want to um, that actually counts those but we know that that the basic mechanics of the lens are basic are essentially working now um, there is a little bit of cleanup that we'll want to do for one thing you know all these balls are staying here which is a little weird for a couple of reasons like number one they're they're cluttering it but as you might notice every time i tap Remember, those are all still living in the space of the cannonball parent. And so when I move the cannonball parent's parent, um, every time we tap, that pops to a new position. It's gonna bring all those old one, all the old balls with it. So let's, let's do some upgrades to the ball prefab. Um, and we're gonna use a pretty, we're, we're gonna use essentially the same method that we did to hide the text, but since we want that to be, we will want that to be timed um, with the ball. We basically want to set it so like each ball is only on screen for a certain amount of time and then hides itself. Um, since 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 we're using a prefab and, and we're creating like arbitrary instances of it of each time of it each time, it makes sense to on that prefab uh, resource to just have it handle handle all of its own stuff. So it adds its own force and it hides itself later. Um, so, we'll, so we'll copy and paste the behavior component again. This one that is on start. So on as soon as the ball exists, it's gonna apply that force to itself. And also as soon as it exists, it's going to start a timer. We'll say like three seconds this time. Just give it a little bit more time to kind of be on screen and it's going to <laughs> add force to itself right now. Um, we'll change the response type to oops, uh, the response type to set enabled. And um, in this case, we definitely want to leave it blank because um, the behavior script is set up to assume. Um, in this case, set up to assume that we want if if you don't specify something, it's going to be disabling this object. Um, so we want each copy, which remember we can't we can't access copies of you know future copies of the prefab from the objects panel because uh, because they're created after the lens is started. So we want it to just be able to self-reference and disable itself. And um, and so we'll apply that in a second. One quick thing that I also want to add to the ball is like. They, that's, it's like weird that they can get stuck there. Um, I think it's, it's because there's a little bit of a rail there so it can kind of like get situated in that. But more importantly, it doesn't really behave like a basketball. 
And that's because it's using the default matter. So again, nothing is specified on the, uh, we're on the ball prime objects uh, physics body component. Nothing is specified, so it's using the basic matter. What we can do is add a new resource and we're gonna go search for matter, physics matter um, resource, not a component. We're gonna add it to a component. Um, and so we'll call this ball matter and we want it to bounce. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn up the bounciness to like a good value. You know, it's not like the most bouncy thing in the universe, but it's pretty bouncy or it should be anyway. So I'm going to just drag that new matter component into the matter slot. And so now each ball's physics body will, will know, okay, not, not only you know, is, do I have like a certain mass, I can bump into stuff, but when I bump into stuff, I need to be bouncy. Um, and so, so let's apply those changes. Remember, we, we added that extra behavior component and added the matter to our prime reference copy. And so now to make sure that applies to all the future prefabs, we'll apply. And then after applying, it's kind of weird that that, 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 that initial reference copy just, just shows up immediately. I'm gonna disable that. And I wanna make sure not to apply any, uh, to apply after I have disabled the reference copy. We wanna keep it around so that like later on, if we wanted to change the ball, maybe add like more behaviors to it, we would be able to enable it and work on it. But so, so we do want to keep it kind of in the scene, but we don't want it to start off. But also we want to uncheck it after applying because if we apply now, then it's going to apply that, uh, the disabled property to every future ball. So even if we tap, nothing's gonna show up. Um, so I wanna make sure to apply while it's enabled and then disable it. Great, so we've got our prototype. Now let's think about, let's start thinking about ways that we can, we can continue boosting it. It's, it feels like it's behaving nicely. I, you know, I like how the ball bounces now. We have the score detection. Um, we still have that rotator, which is, it's still happening. Even though we can't see it because we hit its render mesh, uh, it still has this tween transform. So um, I kind of, like I, might, I may have said earlier, I, I kind of like that challenge. And I think we can actually do something more with that. So, so I wanna continue using it, but um, remember we had some issues with the, uh, the visual, it was, it was a little too big, but we do want it to be able to indicate to us what, like what vector the ball is actually gonna be using. And so first of all, we can pull the rotator directly to the target shot spot and as a child of target shot spot, if we set its position values to zero, um, we can set its rotation values, they won't matter, but the, the position values will snap our, our rotation visualizer kind of to uh, directly where the target shot spot is. So now that'll always be with us. The ball is still able to shoot out and um, behave properly as per physics because it's still created in, in the, um, in the plane system. So that's great. So let's make some, let's make a, a couple of little improvements to our rotator. So first of all, it's, it's kind of big. Um, I want to, I, uh, this, the, the Canon makes it a little bit hard to see. So let's choose a different visual. I'm going to go into the asset library and it's already searched. So um, in the search bar up top, I'm going to search for primitive pack. And you can type in shape and it comes up, but we want this primitive pack that has all of these different uh, basic shapes in it. So I'm gonna import that. And you'll see it adds into our resource panel, these primitive pack resources and a, another prefab that kind of lets you test what the different resources are. Um, so, but it importantly, it gave us all these meshes. And so I'm going to, now, now we can, uh, change this, the, this Canon mesh, the object three is like the Canon barrel. We can type in cylinder 
And in that primitive pack, we have a cylinder mesh. So if I set that, it's gonna be huge. Let's see what we can do about that. We will, if we scale it down a little bit, you can see now, now it's a cylinder, but it's kind of sideways. And um, I mentioned a moment ago how the rotation value isn't really gonna matter. And that's because, remember, we have this tween transform script that as soon as the lens starts, no matter what its starting rotation is, the tween script is modifying the rotation of this rotator object. So, so any the, the render mesh visual that we supply it is going to be kind of fixed based on the axes that the um, that this cylinder was first built on, which aren't quite matching up with our rotator. So instead, I'm going to copy this component and hide it, and I'm just going to put all the visuals as uh, child objects of the rotator. What I want to do with these cylinders is we want to just build like an arrow that'll be a little bit um, a little bit uh, smaller in our scene, uh, so it'll be a little easier to see what's going on behind that. Um, and so, so I'm going to I'm going to create a scene object, a child of the rotator, and I'm going to paste that render mesh that we just copied, and now we have another cylinder. But now since it's just it's just living inside that rotator space, um, we can apply a different rotation. And if I focus on it. I can see that the blue is the Z axis. I want to I want to kind of rotate it around so that the ball doesn't come out the side. It comes out like the top of it. So again, it's just a it's just a matter of of mismatched axes. So if we just apply that direct ninety degree rotation, now the ball kind of shoots out the direction of that cylinder. And now I'm going to add a couple more components to make that. What where am I? <laughs> to make that um, into an arrow. So we can name this arrow one and uh, I'll control D to duplicate it. And I'm gonna move that one forward. And it looks like backward, but I'm watching watching my scene as I move this, I'm gonna duplicate it one more time. And uh, watching, the, watching the scene preview, we're just adding a couple to make like a dotted line. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna add one more one more duplicate. I'm going to pull this one out a little farther. And instead of a cylinder, I'm going to give it a cone. And so, and so now we have an arrow head. I'll name it arrow head. Ooh, that might mess with the script. And I want it to be a little bit bigger, just so it's you know clear that it's an arrow head. And and now so, so we're making use of this uh, this rotation space to kind of show show our where our visualizer is going. Um, and I I love the that that sort of extra challenge element that we have going on. And I would like to have a little bit of side to side rotation as well. And so so real quick, um, I I know we want to get to question and answer um, potentially. And so uh, so. Just want to ah, real quickly uh, show one one more quick thing. So we're going to take a copy of this rotator, and essentially we're going to stack uh, transform spaces on each other a little bit. And so without having to calculate all of the like different kind of vectors that could be going on, um, what we can do is use relative space to make that a little easier on ourselves. I'm going to copy its uh, twin transform component, and then. Within the target shot spot space, I'm going to create another scene object, and I'm going to call this one our lateral rotate rotator, and paste the transform. Instead of the Z, I want this one to pivot around the uh, vertical y-axis. So give it zero, and you'll notice that that freezes our initial rotator because in the in the tween transform component that we copied, it was specifically referencing itself. We'll call this one the, apologies, I made it go away. We'll call this one the vertical rotator. So, uh, <laughs> so that object is still being referenced on the lateral rotators component. So we want to specify this object and give it 
just a little bit of shake back and forth. And what having what what we can gain by having two twin transforms is we can enter like a totally random value in here. Uh, and that this value is almost never going to divide evenly into four seconds. So it, it's never, it's not really going to be like a one up and one down. Once we drag the vertical rotator as a child of the lateral rotator, now we see we have a little bit of wobble, but within that wobbling kind of side to side space, there's still this rotator, uh, this, this vertical one that is giving us that nice up and down sweep. So we can kind of slowly choose like how high we want our shot to be, but there's also a little bit of variance added in. And, um, and since, since the times are very different factors from each other, it is a good way to kind of add a, add a lot of quick randomness by having, having each of these objects um, handle one of the axes separately on a different time. They're not gonna line up. So like when the, uh, you know, when the vertical rotator hits its top at four seconds, that's gonna be like some random point within the lateral rotator's animation. So it's not always gonna be like at the top of the parabola, it's gonna be like always, <laughs> always shaking. Um, and just to, just to real quick, take a look at what we have uh, for our scene setup. We've got on a tap event, we're instantiating the prefab, that ball physics body in the shot spot space. On, on tap as well, um, we have our, our position shot spot script. That's our specific uh, behavior script that we added that is moving the shot spot, snapping it right to the target spot that is relative to the camera. Within that, um, we have these twin transform scripts that are uh, with, within our target shot spot. Okay, we've got that facing uh, this way. Within that, we wanna add a little bit of, uh, of sideways rotation. And then within that space, we also wanna add a little bit of vert vertical rotation. And that gives us that final ball vector, which um, is, is shooting out at 400. Uh, I forget exactly what the units are, but right along, along that vector that is determined by all of those cascading uh, parent space relationships to give the ball its direction. And so I can pull this up and, and we'll just review our final flow chart. Um, these will all be available on, uh, on the YouTube. So, so you'll be able to go and take a look back through this flow chart as well as the uh, project files. Um, and so I do want to leave a little bit of time for live folks to have if there are any questions, but essentially we're here, we're, we're at our testable prototype. So there's a lot of ways we can go from here. And, um, and uh, if, you know, there's oh, on one final, <laughs> one final note that I want to leave you on, um, looks like we don't have any questions yet. So so another another thing that we can think about now is like how do we how do we try and, and break what we have? So um, we won't we won't dive into that too much today, but um, think about like what ways could this possibly break? Like um, we have our score detector in the center here, but what if you know? The ball kind of goes in and touches the score detector and, and then bounces out. Um, now, now that we're at a stage where we can where we can test this, um, we you can spend some time playing with the lens and um, and and now that now that we've got this basic functionality working, now is a good time that we could push it to our device and actually test it in a real environment. Um, you know, potentially change the speed of the ball if it's too, uh, it, you know, if it's if it's too easy or too hard, we could we could like modulate the speed of the ball. Um, we can, uh, you know, if if the ball could potentially go in, overlap with the score detector in the hoop, and then bounce out, we might want to kind of uh, mitigate that. Maybe set uh, a um, a 
overlap detector above the hoop and another one below the hoop, and they have to be kind of triggered in sequence. Um, so just to make sure, you know, like the ball can't like bounce on the ground and then back up and trigger a scoring event. But for now, we've there was there was a perfect example where it kind of bounced uh, out and and did trigger the overlap detector. But for now, we got a pat on the back. We have gotten to this to this phase where we've got a testable prototype. We've made a couple of a couple of quick boost edits to it. You know, we might want to uh, maybe hide the give a new material to this arrow so that it's a little bit easier to see through. And those are just kind of like slow quality of life improvements. Um, but this is a perfect opportunity for us to save a version of this lens um, and save another and then save another version and do our updates on top of that. I think we've still got no no live questions, so that will be my final thought. Um, once you get to a point where your lens is working, save that version and save a different version that you start working on because it is always, always nice to have a working version of the lens that you can go back to. Like if you add a bunch of updates to your, you know, to your uh, kind of live updating version, um, a point like this where you can go back if your live up, if you make an update and it kind of breaks part of the functionality and you might not be sure why, it's good to have a, uh, you know, this, your, your kind of initial basic working version of, of all the features that you can go back to and just double check and confirm like, you know, is, is this, uh, you know, if, if it's not like shooting the right direction, like was our, was our lateral rotator at a different axis or something like that. Um, so, so yeah, final thought is, Increment, uh, save often, and um, save different versions so that you can go forward and apply updates without any worries. So I guess if we, if there's any last second questions, let us know. I don't see anybody in the chat. And so, um, Anyway, I, I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming out and for uh, for people viewing later on. Thanks for watching. Um, and I hope you all had a, a great time these past couple of weeks and maybe learned some new features about Lens Studio. And um, so I look forward to seeing all of the different implementations that you all take with this uh, with this Hoops lens. So yeah. Definitely, um, you know, make this your own and have some fun with it. Give it some funky gravity. Who knows? You know, you can you can go anywhere from this point. Um, and I love that. <laughs> That's so fun. So, <sighs> thanks everybody. Uh, I see someone in the chat is anxious to try it out. Um, don't worry. Uh, this will be also, um, just to note, this will be uh, recorded on YouTube, it's live on YouTube as well right now, um, but if, uh, if you want to go there, that's a great place to, you know, go back through some of this and pause if you need to. Uh, I'll be monitoring the comments there, so if you have any comments, um, you can ask me directly on, on the YouTube, which we will, you'll, you'll be getting a link. Um, oh, I think, okay, cool, it's still copied, awesome. Uh, here's a link that has the project files. It's got um, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I have to do it a few times as well. <laughs> um, so, so that link, which will also be in the YouTube description, has the project files, um, the finished version from, uh, from step, step one, so you can follow along, as well as uh, it will, soon it'll have this finished version from, uh, from, uh, part two of the workshop series so that you can kind of have like that start and end point to compare. And with that, thanks everybody.